Well, thank you. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity, and uh, I'm uh, grateful to be in the kind of company that uh, giving the Pope lecture puts me in. Um, I'm especially grateful to have the chance to talk about the kinds of questions, the kinds of issues that uh, I've been asked to raise, which are really fundamental questions about this moment in American life. And to have the chance to talk about that with students and with faculty at such a great university uh, is an honor for me, so thank you. In a sense, what I want to talk about is the large, broad set of frustrations and concerns that uh, have been flooding our politics in recent years. I want to think with you about where these come from, what they mean, where they might be pointing us. American politics today certainly seems like it is drowning in a frustration and anxiety. That's been both a cause and a consequence of the 2016 elections, but it runs a lot deeper than that, and it's been with us much longer than that. The 21st century, almost from the moment it began, has been a very uneasy time for American politics. We've seen that in the tone and tenor of our debates, in the kinds of elections and candidates that they've raised, in the sorts of concerns that we hear expressed. Listening to our political conversations at this point, you have to conclude that our country is somehow deeply frustrated. At first glance, our unhappiness, our anxiety might seem pretty easy to explain, again, well before the 2016 election. Our economy has been sluggish since this century began, and not only during the Great Recession. The country's strongest year of economic performance in the 21st century, which was 2004, saw a level of growth that barely reached the average of any of the prior four decades, and we haven't even reached that level since. This century also began with the worst terrorist attack in American history, which shattered our hope for a peaceful post-Cold War world, and things haven't gotten much more stable around the world since then. Our partisan politics has been polarized and intensely divisive. Our cultural battles about sensitive subjects from stem cells to marriage and sexuality to religious liberty to national identity have been fought at a fever pitch that's left people on all sides feeling besieged and offended. And some key indicators that cross economics and culture and politics, like family breakdown and inequality, have also been persistently pointing in troubling directions. Uh, for quite a while now and have stood in the way of mobility and of the American dream. So the opening years of the 21st century have given Americans real reasons to worry, but there's plainly been more to the frustration of this period than a straightforward response to challenging circumstances. We've been frustrated too at the apparent inability of our leaders and our politics to confront these challenges, even sometimes to acknowledge them. Some of that inability or unwillingness to face reality has just been a reflection of the willful blindness of many of us voters and citizens. And some of it has been a reflection of a particular tendency toward escapism or denial among some of our leaders. And I want to think with you briefly tonight about each of those. The blindness of voters, often reflected by our leaders, has been expressed above all in a tendency to respond to contemporary problems with nostalgia, with a sense that what's wrong now in America is the way the country has changed from how it used to be, and that solutions could best be found by going backward. That nostalgia just overwhelms our politics now. I'll give you an example of it that I think will strike you as very familiar, not because you've heard this particular statement in, before, but because you hear things like it all the time. How often have you heard a politician in the past few years say something like this? I'll quote a brief paragraph. Many people watching tonight can probably remember a time when finding a good job meant showing up at a nearby factory or a business downtown. You didn't always need a degree. Your competition was pretty much limited to your neighbors. If you worked hard, chances are you'd have a job for life with a decent paycheck and good benefits and the occasional promotion. Maybe you'd even have the pride of seeing your kids work at the same company. That world has changed, and for many that change has been painful. So who is that? That's President Barack Obama in the State of the Union address back in 2011. But it could easily be pretty much any politician in either party now. We know it's not Donald Trump only because it's all in complete sentences. <laughs> but the sentiment easily could be Trump's. He also longs for an America of firm and stable industrial employment before foreign competition took it away. When the New York Times asked President Trump last April when America was last great, he pointed eventually to the 1950s. And it's not just Trump either, of course, with a little bit more of an emphasis on the cultural cohesion and stronger families of that half-remembered golden age. Those lines could have easily come from a Mitt Romney speech, or really from most conservatives. With more explicit emphasis on the low inequality of that time, it could have been Hillary Clinton or Elizabeth Warren. America just isn't what it used to be. That's a key theme of our contemporary politics. 
and it speaks to a public anxiety that often comes down to a question we ask in anguish. What has happened to our country? And you know, it's not a bad question. Something big and significant certainly has happened to our country, and in its less cartoonish forms, today's nostalgia is understandable. The America that our exhausted, wistful politics misses so much, the nation as it first emerged from the Great Depression and World War II, and gradually evolved from there, was exceptionally unified and cohesive. It had at first an extraordinary confidence in large institutions, big government, big labor, big business that would work together to meet the nation's needs. That confidence really is just stunning from our vantage point now. America's cultural life at mid-century was no less consolidated. It was dominated by a broad traditionalist moral consensus. Religious attendance was at a peak. Families were strong, birth rates were high, divorce rates were low. And in the wake of a war in which most of its competitors had burned each other's economies to the ground, the United States utterly dominated the world economy, offering economic opportunity to workers of all kinds, high skill and mid-skill and low skill. At least for whites in America, which is no small caveat, of course, that time really was exceptional. But almost immediately after the war, that consolidated nation began a long process of unwinding and fragmenting. Over the subsequent decades, the culture liberalized and diversified as struggles against racism coincided with a massive increase in immigration. Meanwhile, some key parts of the economy were deregulated to keep up with rising competitors, and our labor market was forced by globalizing pressures to specialize in higher skill work that has diminished opportunities for Americans with lower levels of education. And in politics, an exceptional mid-century elite consensus on some key issues gave way by the 1970s to renewed divisions that have only gotten sharper and sharper since. In one arena after another, America in the immediate post-war years was a model of consolidation and consensus, but through the following decades that consensus fractured. And by the end of the 20th century, this fracturing of consensus grew from diffusion into polarization of political views, of economic opportunities, of incomes, of family patterns, of ways of life. We've grown less conformist but more fragmented, more diverse but less unified, more dynamic but less secure. All of this has met many gains for America in national prosperity, in personal liberty, in cultural diversity, in technological progress, in social justice, in options, in choices, in every realm of life. But over time, it's also, it's also meant a loss of faith in institutions, a loss of social order and structure. A, a loss of national cohesion, of security and stability for many workers, and a loss of cultural and political consensus. Those losses have piled up now in ways that often seem to overwhelm the gains and have made our 21st century politics distinctly backward-looking and morose. Conservatives and liberals have emphasized different facets of these changes. Liberals treasure the social liberation and the growing cultural diversity of the past half century, but lament the economic dislocation, the loss of social solidarity, the rise in inequality. Conservatives celebrate the economic liberalization and the dynamism, but lament the social instability and moral disorder, the cultural breakdown and weakening of fundamental institutions and traditions. The trouble is that these changes are all tied together. The liberalization that the left celebrates is the fragmentation that the right laments and vice versa. That forces liberalizing and fragmenting, diversifying and fracturing are all functions of the essential driving force of American life since the end of the Second World War, what we might very broadly call individualism. In broad terms, the first half of the 20th century up through the Second World War was an age of growing consolidation and cohesion in American life. As our economy industrialized, government grew more centralized, the culture became more aggregated through mass media, and national identity and cohesion were often valued above individuality and diversity. In those years, many of the most powerful forces in American life were pushing each American to become more like everyone else. And the nation that emerged from World War II was therefore highly and exceptionally cohesive. The second half of the 20th century, and these opening decades of the 21st century too, then marked an age of growing deconsolidation and decentralization, as the culture became increasingly variegated and diverse, the economy gradually diversified and in some respects deregulated, and individualism and personal identity came to be held up above conformity and national unity. In these years, many of the most powerful forces in American life have been pushing each American to become not more like everyone else, but more like himself or herself. Mid-20th century America, especially the 1950s and 60s, stood between these two distinguishable periods, and for a time could keep one foot in each of them. 
combining dynamism with cohesion to an exceptional degree. That kind of straddling of cohesion and diffusion or unity and diversity really was a wonder to behold. It's not surprising that we idolize that time and miss it. It offered us a stable, cohesive backdrop for different forms of liberalization, be it toward cultural liberation or toward market economics. But that liberalization has done its work, and our society is in many ways its result. We're a highly individualistic, diverse, fragmented society, economically, politically, and culturally, and none of that is about to be undone. So we're going to have to solve our problems as such a society. Both our strengths and our weaknesses are functions of this path that we've traveled together, and we will now have to draw on those strengths to address those weaknesses. That's one way to think about what's happened to our country. It's the central challenge of the politics of 21st century America. How to use the advantages of a diverse, dynamic society to address the disadvantages of a fractured, insecure society. But if that doesn't sound like the question that our politics is asking itself, that's because it just isn't. Our political culture has not been very good at grasping either the challenges we face or the strengths we possess to face them. It's instead been overwhelmed by nostalgia, by a desire to reverse the process of liberalization and diffusion that's transformed our society, and so, whether in economic terms for the left or in cultural terms for the right, to recreate a consolidated, centralized consensus that defined American life not all that long ago. The first step toward a constructive 21st century politics would have to be to see that such a reversal is not really an option and that we actually wouldn't really want it anyway. Instead, we have to think about how to address the challenges of dissolution and diffusion, challenges like the breakdown of the family, the loss of worker security, growing polarization and inequality, the hollowing out of our institutions and our loss of faith in them by making the most of strengths like diversity and dynamism and specialization. We have to look forward, but the second facet of the failure of our political system to confront reality has to do with a failure to look forward properly, or rather with an unwillingness among some of our leaders to acknowledge that their cherished vision of the future may just not be what the future looks like at all. That cherished elite vision of the future is a function in many ways of an attempt to make sense of the post-Cold War world by emphasizing the best facets of the liberalization or diffusion that I've been describing. In the 1990s, elites of both the right and left in our country and around the West came to believe that the end of the Cold War would bring about an era of liberal peace. For America's intellectual and political leaders, that raised the possibility of making the most of the advantages made possible by our decades of liberalization while overcoming or even just putting aside the disadvantages. So market dynamism could coexist with cultural diversity and the question would be how to spread the bounty of both. A casual observer of the 2000 presidential campaign between Al Gore and George W. Bush might have imagined that our two parties had found a fairly plausible left and right wing paths toward doing this. That campaign was an argument about how to govern after the end of history. Read George W. Bush's first State of the Union address, February of 2001, and you'll find yourself in an alternate universe. As Bush put it, America had, quote, a balanced budget, big surpluses, peace with its neighbors. The question is how not to waste opportunities. Just a year later, in his second State of the Union address, January of 2002, the world had changed dramatically. The September 11th attacks had launched an era of insecurity and chaos. A recession had taken hold, too, and the foundations of our common life seemed much shakier. History had refused to end because it never really was on its way toward ending. We couldn't quite perceive it then, but that dark turn should have marked the end of the illusions of the 1990s, the illusions shared in common by many in the West that the process of liberalization that I've just described and the growing diversity of our societies combined with the long hoped for end of the Cold War would finally mean the triumph of progressive liberal democracy around the world, the achievement at last of the future they'd always dreamed of. But in fact, that's just not what the progress of liberalization and fracture made possible. And it was not what the end of the Cold War made possible. Instead, they brought the resurgence of long submerged forces, nationalism and populism, ethnic tensions and economic resentments. These would be the challenges of the post-Cold War world, the challenges that would torment the West in the early 21st century. And to this day, our leaders have not really figured out how to govern amid the actual realities of this period. Global instability and rising threats, weak growth at home that leads to economic insecurity and to daunting public fiscal challenges, a culture at war with itself, and the continuing fracturing and fragmentation of family, 
and community and social institutions. Political elites throughout the developed world have made the mistake of treating problems like these as threats to the dream of governing at the end of history, rather than as threats to the actual physical and social and cultural and economic security of their particular citizens. They've not grasped that their expectations at the beginning of this century might just have been an error, the function of a failure to appreciate the downsides of how their societies had long been changing. And so they've treated their people's frustrations as part of the problem, rather than as reasons to rethink key premises and to change course. Our politics has been shaped by a public trying to tell its leaders something they don't want to hear, and those leaders responding not by listening, but by looking for ways to get voters to shut up. And increasingly, voters are refusing to do that. We could see this dynamic in the Brexit debate in the UK in 2016 and in the politics of much of Western Europe. In our politics in America, it may be most evident before that year's election in our immigration debates, in which a broad cosmopolitan coalition had repeatedly tried to roll over opposition to any kind of increased immigration, offering critics basically nothing but the enforcement of already existing laws and treating its own efforts as comprehensive while attributing any and all opposition to racism. These kinds of efforts have done enormous harm to our political culture and persuaded many voters that their leaders were liars who despised them. But those leaders still haven't quite grasped what's been going on and have acted on inertia from an era that they can't quite perceive as ended. This widespread elite disorientation has left both parties in our politics adrift and unable to offer very much beyond nostalgia for 20th century high points as an answer to the implications of the long-running fracturing of institutions that for good and bad have transformed our society. Fifteen years after the dream of governing at the end of history should have been shattered, the best that our two party elites could come up with was running George W. Bush's brother and Bill Clinton's wife for president. The two of them perfectly embodied the widespread, if implicit, wish that it could be 2001 again, if not 1965 or 1981, they both seemed disoriented somehow by the world that they were forced to inhabit. This drift, this at times outright condescension of their leaders, combined with a long escalating loss of faith in institutions, has left many voters increasingly frustrated and angry. And what Donald Trump grasped in 2016 was that the unwillingness of leaders in both parties even to see and acknowledge these problems had created an enormous opportunity to appeal to frustrated voters simply by acknowledging their frustrations even without offering any way to address them, as he certainly did not offer. Trump's diagnoses were always more important to his appeal than his prescriptions, which even his biggest fans never really seemed to take seriously. He had grasped something about what decades of fracture had done to America's political culture. He saw that by 2016, alienation was an enormously powerful political force in our country, and that identifying with alienated voters could matter even more than offering concrete answers to their worries. Alienation is an idea that we normally associate with the political left, maybe even with a certain strand of Marxism, but it doesn't have to be. Robert Nisbet, the great 20th century sociologist, defined alienation as a state of mind that can find a social order remote, incomprehensible, or fraudulent, beyond real hope or desire, inviting apathy, boredom, even hostility. And that's precisely how Trump and many of his most vocal supporters frequently talked about America in 2016. It was not the country they had known. Its institutions were a fraud rigged against the public. There was almost no hope for America's future, so that there was nothing to lose by abandoning all norms and taking a shot on an untested leader. Disruption for its own sake was better than just going down with a ship. All of this was mixed for some Trump voters with a powerful sense of loss, which of course is not the same as alienation. Trump's appeal to American greatness surely struck a patriotic nerve among some of his supporters and was received in some quarters as a much needed call to restore the nation's dignity and strength. In this respect, it appealed to some sentiments and to some voters who were frequently drawn to conservative politics. But what was new about Trump's appeal and what ultimately seemed most powerful about it had more to do with a kind of resentment that formed only a very partial reaction against the character of liberalism in our time. It was, to be sure, a reaction in the name of the honor of the citizens today's elites treat with contempt, or the workers today's economy treats as dispensable, the traditions today's culture treats as primitive. But it was a partial reaction because Trump generally channeled the frustrations of these Americans, but not their aspirations. He shared their resentments, but not their commitments, let alone their piety or their devotions. And so he tended to translate their yearnings into alienation of the sort that drew many other Americans to him. 
And in this sense, he exacerbated that alienation that's so prevalent in our politics now, even as he channeled it. Alienation can sometimes make for a powerful organizing principle for an electoral coalition, especially when hostility can overpower apathy among the sentiments that it breeds. But it doesn't make for a natural organizing principle for a governing coalition. The sense of lacking a stake in the nation's institutions, the feeling that those institutions are remote and unresponsive, makes it difficult to know what to do when they fall into your possession. That uncertainty has been powerfully evident in Trump's performance in the presidency in his first year. And I use the word performance intentionally because Trump has approached the presidency as a performer more than an executive. To the extent that he's tried to channel the frustrations of his core voters, it's been by things he has said, while most of what he's done is advanced the old Republican agenda, if haltingly and incompetently sometimes. The question of what will become of voter alienation as a political force beyond that, a force that shapes public policy and drives the evolution of our institutions, therefore remains largely an open question, even a year and more after Trump's term in office began. And it remains open in particular because alienation was not the last word on what the course of the 2016 election could teach us about our fractured country. It's joined by a subtle but powerful yearning for solidarity that points in a more constructive direction and that stands to reshape our political life. That too is clearer in light of the momentous couple of years that we've just lived through together. Maybe it didn't always feel like the last election was an argument about solidarity. It was certainly a terribly divisive election year, even more than usual, and it sharpened the peculiar condition of our politics, which, which involves intense partisanship alongside very weak parties. But near the core of these divisions was a difference of opinion about how to unify the country. Voters were certainly dissatisfied with the choices that their parties offered them. Bernie Sanders won about 43% of the vote in the Democratic primaries. Donald Trump won 45% of the vote in the Republican primaries and took the nomination and eventually the presidency. Voters in both parties were clearly not happy with the status quo. But what can we learn from their choices about just what it was that left them unhappy? On the left, Voters seemed dissatisfied with the Democratic Party's inclination to cast their needs and interests and identities as just more excuses for the same old neoliberal economic tinkering. On the right, voters were dissatisfied with the rote sloganeering conservatism of a lot of the GOP, which repeated the ends of Ronald Reagan's sentences, but had long forgotten how or why they started. In both cases, abstractions about freedom and prosperity seemed less satisfying than they used to, while gestures in the direction of solidarity were deeply compelling, even when they were not fully worked out. But because they were not fully worked out, these gestures could take dark and brutish forms. They were, however, about how to unify the country and be stronger together. On the right, the general idea has been that by building walls around our country, we might be able to break down walls within our country. A revival of nationalism, Trump suggested, could be a unifying force that works by excluding outsiders to include all insiders, and so by offering us a means to define all of us as one. On the left, the quest for solidarity is pointed toward the argument that our society is divided only in the ways in which human individuals in general are divided, by gender or race or ethnicity or identity, and that we can unite despite these divisions by recognizing that we're all human beings, but also acknowledging the value and importance of these differences. This plays down our national identity while playing up our personal identity in the hope that it might offer a more inclusive path to unity. And it means, among other things, that the boundaries between Americans and non-Americans should be fairly porous so that our humanity shines through. One key problem with the left's approach is that it imposes a kind of soft relativism on the culture as a whole, but does so with real coercive force against traditionalists to resist. Coercive relativism is both incoherent and unsatisfying and it puts our core freedoms at risk. But a key problem with the rights approach is that unity pursued by exclusion almost unavoidably becomes divisive and ugly. And it can also seem inviting to people whose desire for a purified unity expresses itself in ethnic or in racial terms. The left's lurch toward solidarity therefore often sounds like a demand for conformity, even at the expense of the freedom of speech or religion. The, right, the right's grasp of solidarity easily come to seem exclusionary or, or intolerant. But the fact that both left and right are eager for solidarity, that our politics is bitterly divided about how to be unified, is worth understanding and is by no means all bad. These shifting emphases of our two broad political coalitions suggest an underlying shift in our common life from an American politics that expresses above all a yearning for freedom of different kinds, 
to one that at least alongside that also expresses a powerful yearning for solidarity. That experience of fracture, of the division and loneliness and alienation that result from it is clearly at the root of that growing desire and it might help to further define the challenge that now confronts our politics. That challenge roughly stated then is how can our diverse dynamic society address the problems of fragmentation and fracture in ways that also contribute to national unity. It won't do to pretend that we can meet that challenge by going backward. The golden age we think we remember was abandoned on purpose because it held us back economically and culturally and morally and because it wasn't so golden for many Americans. But how could we meet that challenge? What we require is a political vision and a governing agenda geared to filling the vacuums that Trump's success has made apparent but has not filled. We need means of addressing problems that combine material want and moral emptiness. We need to help people both meet their needs and be more needed. We need to combat despair and disillusionment by reviving some genuine sources of moral authority and reaffirming the case for both personal and mutual responsibility. We need to fight alienation by putting power a little closer to the interpersonal level, making the social order seem a little less distant. We need to pursue more unity by means suited to the particular forms of our diversity, and so to seek after the broad solidarity of a great nation and not the, the tight solidarity of narrow silos. Public policy can't do all of this, obviously, but maybe it can help here and there. For one thing, using our diversity and fragmentation as a tool of problem solving would require an approach to governing that empowers problem solvers throughout our society, rather than hoping that just one in Washington will get everything right. That means bringing to public policy the kind of dispersed, incremental, bottom-up approach to progress that increasingly pervades every other part of American life an approach that lets authority flow through our mediating institutions and that solves problems by giving people options and letting their choices drive the process of change. This more distributed, decentralized vision of problem solving is how the modern post-industrial economy works, but it's also the logic of federalism embodied in America's constitutional order, the logic of subsidiarity articulated by the best traditions of our civilization. It should speak to both the right and left in different ways. Over the past decade and more, ideas rooted in this kind of vision have been developed and refined by a circle of generally younger policy-minded conservatives on the right. From healthcare to education to welfare, taxation, regulation, and across the full spectrum of domestic issues, they've worked to turn this vision into substantive policy proposals. They share some of the frustration and concerns that animated Trump's appeal, but not its alienation or despair. They seek to appeal to people's aspirations as well as to their worries. And where it's possible, they want problems to be taken up by people who can see each other face to face. That's why, to my mind, although Trump's successes in 2016 suggest that the right in America is becoming less conservative, the frustrations and needs that made his victory possible suggest the need for a resurgence of conservatism. That resurgence would have to understand itself as a civic endeavor as much as a political one. And it should aim, as far as possible, to uproot the disposition toward alienation and despair in American life and to plant in its place the essential conservative tendency to love the good more than we hate the bad. That means looking to improve more than to scorn, to build on what works more than to tear down, and to understand our inadequacies by looking at them in light of what they keep us from being more than what they make us into. And it means taking up problems by beginning from the strengths we have and from what unifies us. A similarly decentralized, community-oriented progressivism is also imaginable. It certainly might come less naturally at first to today's left in America, but it could draw upon a rich tradition of progressive localism and community and labor organizing that, puts, that points in a rather different direction than much of the, what the American left has emphasized in the past few years. And surely decentralization and federalism should have some appeal for progressives now in particular, since national power at this point means power exercised by Donald Trump and by congressional Republicans. Decentralization is just one facet of the change of attitude we need, but a particularly important one. It can't address all of our problems, needless to say, but as a shift of emphasis, it could help. Beyond the familiar applications of this kind of approach in school choice or in conservative approaches to health care, there are ways that forms of decentralization could be of use in taking on some of the distinct problems of our particular moment. It could help, at least at the margins, but maybe also near the core, 
to combat wage stagnation and the loss of working class jobs, for example, by enabling experimentation not only with welfare and wage supports, but with different forms of labor law and worker organizing, and by encouraging competition in higher education and skills training that could create new opportunities. But what about national unity? Decentralization could easily seem like a force for more fragmentation and division, not for unity. I think that would be true if the alternative were a cohesive and consolidated polity. But because the real alternative in the lives of many Americans now is actually isolation and a radical individualism, a more decentralized politics could work to draw people out of their narrow circles and into the public arena, toward a common space where Americans can see each other face to face, and where not every question has to be an all or nothing political fight to the death in Washington. So subsidiarity, federalism, and decentralization could be a focal point for an agenda of renewal. And given the sorry shape of our national politics, that kind of focus could attract people from all corners of our politics. By beginning closer to the ground, we can start to focus again on what holds us together. Champions of localism and subsidiarity in America like to cite Edmund Burke's reference to the little platoons that make up a society. But we would be wise to remember the context in which that line arises for Burke. It's not a case for fragmentation, but exactly for unity. To be attached to the subdivision, to love the little platoon we belong to in society, Burke wrote in 1790, is the first principle, the germ, as it were, of public affections. It is the first link in a series by which we proceed toward a love of our country and of mankind. That first link is broken now, and a love of country, even of mankind, seems in terribly short supply in American political life these days. Given the particular shape of our problems, it seems to me that we could begin to replenish it by taking on more problems where they're found and thinking about politics from the bottom up a little more than we do. The past couple of years have made the need for that kind of approach to politics and policy more clear, but they have not made its success more likely. Our work is very much cut out for us. Our country is frustrated and anxious, and so is having trouble seeing past its troubles to its strengths and opportunities. We're witnessing the exhaustion of an old political order, but not yet the rise of a new one. That's what watching an election campaign between two 70-year-olds should bring home to us. To see the way forward, we need to open our eyes to America's 21st century circumstances, to grasp both the challenges and the opportunities that they represent, and to see how, again, applying our, our enduring American principles to novel circumstances could point the way toward an American revival. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Um, we've got plenty of time for question and answers, uh, well, questions and presumably answers from Yvonne as well, <laughs> questions from you. Um, we are, I'm going to come around with the mic. If you have a, a question, put your hand up. Um, I'll give you the mic and then you can ask your question. Before we do that, though, um, thank you all for coming. This is a ter terrific crowd. I'm really glad you could all come. Um, I was remiss of me. I, I forgot to mention... Um, yeah, someone else who is very important and helpful in arranging this event, which is Sean Cassidy, who's the director of uh, the University Scholars and Honors Program at the moment. I'm sure I saw Sean earlier on. He's around here somewhere, I think. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I wanted to thank uh, USP and UHP as well. So, who has questions? No. Turn around. I did see this, yeah, but it's right at the back. My first question is right at the back. Okay, so has the military-industrial complex had anything to do with the assistance of Donald Trump uh, getting into office by chance, or is there some sort of connection whatsoever? Well, thanks for the question. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, honestly, quite how to answer it. I mean, in a way, it's, it's a funny thing because Trump's views about foreign policy and defense policy and the military have been all over the map. Um, there were times during the campaign when you could easily have seen him as a kind of isolationist. Um, there were other times when you could mistake him for uh, very much a hawk and an interventionist. I think that's actually continued since he was elected. Um, and so I'm really not sure, you know, who the kind of world of defense contractors and military industrial complex actually preferred in 2016, since Hillary Clinton was herself quite an interventionist in some respects.
Um, and I'm not sure what they've thought since. I, I have to say that this, the, the 2016 election cycle, as a matter of policy substance, was unusually confusing. And the usual kinds of, um, of, 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 of patterns of, uh, of issue breakdown just didn't quite work. So honestly, I, I don't know. Thank you. Um, I'll make a comment and then I have a question. Uh, so I've been in local office and ever since the Bush and Ragged, mm. I personally, even at the local level, have seen how the influence of money yeah. seems to uh, distort uh, what I previously thought was a healthy dialogue. And that leads to my question, which is today we're dealing with alternative facts or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. If we can't, as a people, whether or not we agree or not, at least agree on some objective basic truths, then how are we going to engage in these very tough problems? Yeah, thank you. So th there's really two points in there. Uh, I would say that w one, one lesson we might take from the 2016 election is that the, the effect of money in politics is at least not straightforward. Um, Trump certainly spent less than, I think, any of his major primary opponents, and he spent much less than his general uh, election opponent. But he had the advantage of what you referred to in your second part of the question, which was he had the advantage of a kind of bizarre manipulation of the press into just giving him free time uh, to be heard in, a, in an unfiltered way, in a way that's very, very unusual in our politics uh, and, and surely unprecedented in a presidential election. Um, ultimately, I'm not entirely sure where it leaves us. The, the, the lesson a lot of people have tried to draw from that election is that social media have transformed the way that uh, the public gets its information uh, fundamentally and profoundly. I actually think if you look at the, at the opinion data on where people get their information, that doesn't really seem to be true. Uh, most voters get their information from television. By far, most voters do. Those of us who tend to be more engaged with social media or, or even just with the internet, um, have a kind of distorted sense, actually, of how most American voters get their information. Um, and so w w what happens on cable news, and also, to some extent, what, w what's, w what happens in the world of uh, kind of expensive television advertising matters a great deal uh, at election time. And that has not been washed away by this kind of wave of uh, zeros and ones in Facebook and Twitter. Um, at the same time, the question of money in politics um, does force itself to the surface over and over in every election. And I think a lot of the reason for that has to do with the unintended consequences of some of, what we, of, some of the ways we've tried to solve that very problem. Um, that is, we've, by, by constraints on how the parties can spend money and how candidates can spend money, we've driven vast amounts of money to outside groups um, that are much less answerable to the voting public and that are much harder to keep track of. M my solution to that problem would look like transparency, but far fewer restrictions on what parties and candidates can do with money in politics. I think the parties are much more constructive institutions in our politics than the outside groups that drive the kind of polarization that we've seen. The parties are actually moderating groups in our politics. They create or they seek to create broad coalitions, which means that they try to drive the internal coalition politics toward the middle and not toward the extremes. Uh, and what we've done instead, it, by both reforms of the, uh, of the primary process and reforms of campaign finance, is drive money and energy to the edges and polarize our politics. I think the intentions behind a lot of that have been good, but the consequences of it have not been good. And we need to learn lessons from that. It's now been 40 years of this going on. Um, and to think about how to, uh, how to enable the sort of fundamental institutions of our politics, and I would count the parties among them, um, to play the moderating roles and the kind of channeling roles that they're intended to play. Uh, I think that's more part of the solution than, uh, than, than more restrictions on money in politics. Hello. I was kind of interested in your um, example of using the Brexit vote as kind of eliminating the kind of uh, 
tension between political elites and the voting uh, masses and then going on to the Chinese election. Like, how many parallels do you see between what's happening in this country yeah. and other countries, such as the democracies of uh, Western Europe? And uh, do you think some of this is specific to America, or do you think some of the things you've talked about are more universal things? Yeah. Well, I certainly think it's a mix. I mean, I would say this. The, 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 the line, we're in danger of becoming Europe, it, it has been prominent in American politics at every point since before the founding. Um, this has always been a worry Americans have had. It's generally not turned out to be quite that way. The United States has been blessed with more moderate forms of Europe's problems over and over. They had the French Revolution. We had a much less radical revolution. They had very, very extreme social disorder caused by the Industrial Revolution. We had somewhat less extreme social disorder caused by the same sorts of trends. You can see the same thing happening uh, in the post-war period. You can see, to some extent, the same things happening now. The trends are similar. They bear a family resemblance, but they're not the same. They are distinct from place to place, and they're different between America and Europe. I think the Brexit vote, the Brexit vote was a kind of way of making populism a little more safe, right? It, it was cheating in a sense because it put the, the concept of, of national sovereignty on the ballot without a person attached to it. And every time you attach a person to that concept in politics, that person turns out to be massively problematic um, in, in ways that you know, fall into a pattern. Um, and frankly, that's what we saw in 2016 in the United States. If you just put the concept on the ballot, then people can vote for it. And they didn't have to face some of the dark sides of that kind of nationalism, that kind of populism. And we'll see where it goes. I mean, the fact is Brexit, the, the Brits voted for Brexit, and here we are. Uh, it's, in, it's not at all clear how, what form it's going to take, how quickly it's going to happen, um, and in what way it's going to integrate itself into the politics of the, of the United Kingdom. What we saw here was different, but it was connected in the sense that I think it was a response to the exhaustion of the post-Cold War political order. And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing in our politics in general now, is our, pol our, political, our political order is running on fumes. We have not had a kind of basic transformation of our, of our concepts of our political reality in the wake of the end of the Cold War. The Cold War ended in 1990, 1989. That was you know, quite a while ago. Um, a lot of us sort of don't think so. Um, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but it was. And the fact is, we've spent that time trying to retain the political concepts that got us through the Cold War and to force them to keep helping us out. But they don't quite work that way. And so we find ourselves rerunning old elections. We find ourselves with left and right fighting about whether uh, we had it right in 1965 or in 1981. And you know, by now, that's, that's a question that just doesn't speak to more and more voters. Um, and so I, I, I think we are seeing the end of a kind of baby boomer political order. Um, and it, it's, you know, th they're not giving it up easily. If you look at our political leaders, I mean, putting aside maybe just Paul Ryan, who's in his 40s, our national political leaders are basically all around the age of 70. Um, and that is very unusual in America. Um, and I think it has to do with this kind of lack of a middle generation for our society. Um, but I do think that's changing. And inevitably, it will change. And there will be a kind of generational transformation that at least gets us out of some of the nostalgia that I described, which is really fundamentally a baby boomer nostalgia. And it's not all bad. I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to disparage baby boomers. But it is important to have our politics confront 21st century realities, the good ones and the bad. I would say we're, we've actually been better at seeing the problems than at seeing the strengths we have in the 21st century, which our politics has no idea about. You, to hear our politicians talk, you would think that the country that all of you are inheriting is just a colossal disaster. Well, it's just not. The country that all of you are inheriting is a great and wonderful gift that you should be very grateful for. Uh, it's an accomplishment, an enormous social achievement, unlike anything in human history. And it gives you a lot to work with in solving the problems you have. And if you listen to our politicians talk to you right now, you just wouldn't think so. And that is a failure of leadership. It's a failure of leadership that has got to be overcome. Um, going back to what you just said, um, have you seen any candidates um, following Trump's election, potentially, that might embody 
solidarity that you're looking for? And if not, what might somebody who does look like? Like, what would they have to say? Yeah. For you to be like, okay, they are a new order politician. They're leaving behind the old age of, like, kind of regressive politics. What would they look like? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, look, I think there are some people who you can point to as trying to find their way toward this. Uh, it's easier for me to see them on the right because I'm on the right, so I tend to like what they say. They certainly exist on the left, too. You can look at, uh, you can look at, at today's kind of younger generation of senators, people in their 40s and early 50s. There's a range of people that I would put in this category, from Ben Sass from Nebraska to Mike Lee from Utah, who are quite different. In, in their views and in their, and in their tenor and in their attitudes. But I think both of them exemplify a certain kind of communitarian conservative attitude about the future. Uh, there are others in, in that general age group who exemplify various kinds of conservatism that could be of use going forward, from, from Ted Cruz to, uh, to, uh, to Marco Rubio. Uh, again, all, all these folks are, and in some ways Paul Ryan, they're all about the same age. They're in their mid-40s to early 50s. Um, they're not, they look at the country and their reaction is not, this is not my country, right? Their reaction is to see some problems and to see some strengths. I think that for now, there are fewer people like that on the left. The, the, the left lacks a middle generation in a sense. They've got leaders who are in their 70s. They've got activists who are in their 20s. Um, there are just too few people in that middle space. I think that'll change over time. That, that, it doesn't seem to me to be, a, to be a structural problem on the left. It's just a function of having been in power in the executive branch for eight years. And you know, these people will gradually emerge into politics. I think that's what happened on the right. That's where these people came from. A lot of them had been in the Bush administration um, and you know, then became political figures nationally. So I, I, think there, I think there is hope there. And I, I, you know, th there's a vacuum to be filled. And so that'll happen in our politics. Th it's an opportunity. I think the, the opening for a leader who is not simply down on the future is a huge opening in our politics right now. And on the left and right, you will find people who try to fill it in various ways. Hi, so I would like to know um, where do you think this, this change of political culture of alien uh, nation and fragmentation would take place? Do you think it would take place on um, the right, the left, or do you see uh, the potential of a third party? Yeah, well, I, I think a third party is very hard in our political system. Um, you know, it, the way the system is set up with, with first past the post elections, it's just very hard to organize a third party that doesn't simply end up splitting one of our big parties and so empowering the other one. Um, and so what, what tends to happen is that the, the, these kinds of third forces in our politics uh, get integrated into both parties in one way or another. Um, and so I, I would expect that, um, first of all, I, I would think that this kind of more constructive politics emerges uh, at the local and the state level before the national level. Again, right now, it would just be very hard for it to happen in Washington. It's a little easier for it to happen in states and in cities. And you see it in some respects. There are certainly places in our country where there is a lot of, of bipartisan agreement in politics uh, because there has to be. They have no choice but to solve practical problems. Uh, and so it happens. In, in, in my state, in Maryland, we have a, a quite conservative Republican governor, a pretty liberal uh, Democratic legislature. And you know, they don't like each other, but they work together. They don't have a choice. Uh, that's how our politics works. It forces accommodation when it's functioning. Um, I think that's likely to happen first at the local level and only then at the national level. Uh, but I, I would think that in different forms, it begins to happen in both the left and the right. The basic reason for that really is people are unsatisfied. You don't find a lot of people who are just simply happy with the status quo in American political life. And that means change happens. Now, it doesn't mean great change happens, right? It could be a disaster. But it seems to me that the, the, the opportunities for drawing on the, 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 the political resources that we have, our political traditions, our political instincts on both sides of our politics are there. 
so that at least there could be, as one force competing for the public's uh, votes, this kind of more constructive approach to solving our problems. And you know, I, uh, that, 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 makes me, that, that means that I'm hopeful. Um, I don't count myself an optimist. Optimism is, is silly, right? It's just expecting good things to happen. Don't just expect good things to happen. But hope means you think the resources are there for good things to happen. Hope moves you to act. And I think there are reasons to act at this point. There are reasons to believe that action could be worthwhile. And so, Joe, you know. uh, I'm curious, you, you, uh, tonight we've talked a lot about politics and the questions have been very focused on what happens in elections and with voters. The other, but you also mentioned the other institutions yeah. and, the, and the little platoons, families, religion, things along those lines. So, uh, what role do you see that happening? <laughs> or is there, how do you see that playing out in all of this uh, as, without policy prescription yeah. and, and being able to have engagement and, and solutions coming through those channels? Yeah, I mean, to me, that's very central. As I suggested in the talk, I think part of what it means to decentralize our politics is not just to move power to local government or to state government, but also to allow some power to flow through our mediating institutions, which are not just political institutions, to allow what happens at the level of the community uh, of the civic institution of the church uh, to matter in how we solve our problems. And a decentralization of political power can help that happen. It doesn't, it's not all that's required. What's really required is for people to want that, right? Is for people to invest themselves in the institutions that are near them. And I, I do think that what's required for that is some diminishment of the sense that our politics is just a fight to the death in Washington some reduction of the temperature of our national politics would have to happen for people to think that it's worth their while to invest more of themselves in what happens locally, both in political and in civic terms. Uh, and so I, I, I think that some degree of, of, of greater decentralized federalism would help that happen, some. Um, I say some and I say help and I say a little because look, I don't have a solution to this problem. I, I think that there are ways to improve things but I would not say that any of us knows a formula for turning things around. What we need to think about is how to create the circumstances for people where they are to find solutions to the problems they confront. Um, you know, that's not, a, uh, that's not a panacea, but I think politics is all about incremental improvements, is all about marginal improvements. Uh, and when we imagine that it's more than that is when we really create big problems. Hi, uh, my name is Elijah Valdez. I'm a computer engineering major, computer engineering and history major here at NC State. Um, and I was wondering if you could comment on, uh, because I feel like many of the issues of stratification and separation you've talked about today have to do with um, the federalism, uh, the way our system, very endemic to the system of politics, yeah. in contrast to um, parliamentary systems where you sort of only have two parties, and therefore the parties must capture so many ideals into themselves. For example, I find, my, I find it very, very difficult to agree with certain people just based on one or two things. Yeah. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that we have a two-party system exclusively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, the, the, the two-party system always feels constricting, right? Because it forces you to share a coalition with people who you just kind of agree with about this, and you very much don't agree with about that. Um, but I, I think we have to step back and see that what that actually means is that it forces us into coalitions of accommodation. And so to demand that we have precise representation, that our exact view, who I am in every way, is represented in our political system, has a cost, has a dark side. It, it, it tends to increase our division. It tends to make it harder to form coalitions, not easier. And what our system of government tries to do, as I understand it, 
is to force accommodation in a very diverse society. A parliamentary system doesn't do that. A parliamentary system says you form a majority and then you get to do what you want for as long as you can hold on to that majority. Our system actually just does not say that. Our system says you always fight for everything you want to do and fight means try to reach political accommodation. The Congress, the core, the central institution of our constitutional system is a venue for accommodation. It's a place to argue and reach some kind of compromise. Now, it's not playing that role now. The Congress is very dysfunctional. But I think that argues for reforms of the institution that help it play the role that it's meant to play. I am very resistant to arguments for transforming the Congress in the direction of a parliament. And so, for example, I don't think we should get rid of the filibuster, which right now a lot of people on the right would like to do, because right now the party of the right has a majority in the, in the Senate, and so we want to get everything we can get done done. I think that's a mistake. I, I, uh, frankly, I, I, I would incline more toward creating a filibuster rule in the House than eliminating the filibuster rule in the Senate. Because Congress has got to be designed to compel accommodation. That's what it's for in our politics. And so I'm just not inclined to the parliamentary model of the European democracies. I don't think it's well suited to the sorts of problems that we have. Um, so you mentioned uh, decentralization as a way to uh, strengthen our mediating institutions. And uh, you also mentioned our need, the need for our politics and policy to focus towards the future and some constant focus for focusing, focusing towards the past. Um, well, like pragmatically, what does this decentralization look like? like what is that exactly are we decentralizing? And um, also, like, what would policy prescriptions that look forward be like in your Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's the right question. I, I, I would say, first of all, we have to think about places where the ways in which we do public policy tend to channel power upward uh, where it ought to be left closer to the level of the public. Welfare policy is one example of where that might be done. We've done some of that in, 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 in American politics in the last generation, but I think much more of it could be done where the problems people confront differ from place to place. Welfare is not just about people who are short of money. It's there to help people who are living in broken places, amid broken communities and families, where they face enormous challenges. And those challenges are not the same in every place. And so th th our welfare system could use some of our national wealth to enable problem solving that is itself more focused on individual problems in individual places. And so it allows localities, or at least state governments, to design solutions that look more like the problems they have to deal with. I think something like that logic could also work in healthcare, where the, the kinds of problems we have would be amenable to solutions that do look different from state to state. Health, health insurance regulation has tended to be state-based until the last few years. Um, I, I think it would make sense to allow some of the kinds of solutions that people talk about in terms of enabling people to afford access to coverage to be state-based solutions rather than a single federal solution. Um, I think something like that is important to try, for example, in higher education, where we don't think of higher ed as a, nas as a centralized policy arena, but in fact, because of the student loan system, higher ed is very centralized and very nationalized, and allowing, uh, for example, different ways of accrediting institutions of higher education in different places could allow us to experiment with a variety of different ways of helping people get the skills they need to enter the workforce. Um, our education system is decentralized. It's very decentralized. Um, but again, I think that there are ways of allowing that system to serve the needs of families and communities where they are um, that, that could be more about family choice. And that's a form of decentralization, even from today's rather decentralized education system. Uh, so, uh, you know, th those are the sorts of ways I'm thinking about. Taking power that right now uh, has been put in the hands of, of basically program designers in Congress and administrators in Washington and trying to move some of that power to the state level. The reason that I use the term subsidiarity in talking about this and not just federalism, the, the, the subsidiarity is a, is a term that comes from Catholic social teaching, but what it really means is to have power reside at the lowest level where it can practically be put to good use. Uh, 
not always at the local level. There are things that can only be done at the national level. I think national defense can only work at that level. There's some kind of, of environmental policy that just can't be local. It wouldn't work. Um, but we ought to have a preference, a default preference for, uh, f for the local, for the near at hand. I think that's a, a kind of um, a general default approach to public policy that ought to guide how we think about reforming the institutions we have. Questions kind of a lot different than all the other questions. <laughs> but um, you talked about how um, President Trump's election had a lot to do with him appealing to frustrated voters, but he actually like, didn't do anything about those frustrations. Like, didn't have answers to those frustrations. And um, I think that lack of solidarity, like, uh, President Trump's kind of represents exactly what you're saying in a lot of ways about a lack of solidarity. I think my question is like, because he had like the lowest approval ratings in a first year of presidency for a long, long time, from yeah. what I remember. And so I think I would like to know what you think about the next election and if you think that he'll run again. And if he does, could he win? Yeah. Well, you know, in our politics, the, the, the greatest fortune that each party has is the other party. And, um, the question to ask about whether Trump runs again and wins again is who will run against him? Who will the Democrats put up? Um, I think within the Republican Party, Trump is popular. Uh, he has the support of more than 70% of Republicans. That's less than Republican presidents usually have, but it's a lot. Um, nationally, he is very unpopular, as you say. For a president who's been in office for one year, um, you know, generally speaking, his popularity ratings are below 40%, and that's not very good. Um, we've seen presidents lower than that, but um, it's not very good. And those presidents generally haven't won re-election if they're in their first term lower than that. Uh, I, I think the only answer I can really offer to your question at this point is who knows, right? We're a year in. I know it feels like 20 years, but we're a year in. Um, and, you know, m m more news happens every day now than in, in the average month in, the, in a normal political uh, situation. And things can change a lot. Um, but do I think he'll run again? I think he'll run again. Um, I think he wants to win again. I'm not sure he loves being president. It doesn't always seem that way. But, um, but you know, I, the, the kind of ambition that gets you to run the first time doesn't just disappear. And so I would expect that. Could he win again? Yeah, he could win again. Um, I think you'd have to bet against it. He's not popular right now. But who beats him, right? I, I would love for there to be a candidate even within the Republican Party who challenges him. Um, but you, you always have to ask the question, who beats him? Um, and right now, at this point, I'm not sure I see an answer to that question. That can change, obviously. Uh, and the Democrats have some time to get their act together and to think about what they want to put before the country. But I would not say that you can just look at his poll ratings now and say, well, this isn't going to work out. Um, and certainly not that he wouldn't run again. Are there any, uh, any more questions? Anyone have a, any question? um, I, I was going to ask the last question. And funny enough, it was partially that question that was just asked. But you, you picking up on in, internal Republican politics, um, you move in Republican and conservative circles, I know they're not always the same. Uh, Certainly not now. Um, is, there, is there any serious discussion, you know, I read a little bit about it, hear a little bit about it, about there being um, a, a primary challenge? I know that a lot of this will be contingent upon, upon what happens this November, but... Yeah. Is, is, is this serious and are people sort of saying, I'll do it if, if some kind of condition is met? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think there is talk about it. I mean, the, 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 the most striking thing to me in dealing with a lot of members of Congress every day in the work I do is the difference between their attitude about the president in private and in public. Um, 
there is not a lot of respect and regard for President Trump among Republicans in Washington. Um, and if you look at how people behave around him, almost everything that everybody does is aimed at manipulating him somehow. Whether right or wrong, they're succeeding in this. Everybody thinks they're manipulating President Trump all the time. Um, but th they have just been through an experience of watching their voters elect someone who they did not expect their voters to like. And that's a disorienting thing for a politician. And so I think Republicans in Washington are still trying to figure out what it is they've been missing about their own voters. Um, and maybe even what it is they're missing about their own voters now. I think there will be people who are inclined to challenge him in the primaries uh, in 2020. But whether or not that kind of challenge can be serious and can be successful, it's just much too soon to know. If things look in, in two years as they do now, I think the answer to that is no. Um, he is popular with the voters who would decide who the next Republican nominee is going to be. Um, and you know it's generally not wise to bet against the incumbent situations like that. But things will change. The one thing we can be sure about is that things won't be exactly the same in two years as they are today. And so, you know, if, if things do change in a way that undermines his popularity within the party, are there people there who might consider running against him? Sure, I think there are. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Well. We really appreciate it. Thanks.